Um, we'll just talk a little bit about MnDOT's bridge maintenance training program for both state and local agencies, as uh, Bill mentioned. First, just a little bit about our organization. So we have eight districts, uh, 18 bridge maintenance supervisors that supervise 20 bridge maintenance crews around the state. And traditionally, training has consisted of the supervisors and the lead workers passing down knowledge to their crew members. Um, so why did we kind of need to go into this more formal process? Well, in 2010, 2011, we had an early retirement incentive where we lost hundreds of years of bridge experience, bridge maintenance experience. Over 50% of our remaining crew members now had less than five years of experience. And so it was kind of a wake up call for us. We didn't have a formal process in place to transfer knowledge. And as you saw when Sue Mulvihill was talking in the welcome, I mean, succession planning is key. And it's not only key for an effective workforce, but for an efficient one and a consistent one around the state. But where do we start? How do we identify what our training needs are? And so we developed a skills assessment to try to identify those gaps. And so we had our supervisors evaluate the crew members and look at where our gaps were in general bridge knowledge, in preventive and reactive maintenance practices, in tools and equipment that are needed to perform those maintenance activities. And from that, we could kind of identify our top training needs. From that skills assessment that was performed, um, we identified welding as one of our needs, um, just general knowledge and bridge principles and practices and materials. And then um, with actual concrete finishing, some of the trades work, concrete finishing, carpentry, masonry, and then areas of rescue. We work in a lot of remote locations, so if we're out in some of these locations, how, what happens if um, we get ejected out of a snooper bucket or something else? How can we rescue ourselves and how do we kind of plan for that scenario? And then repair in, in steel, in joints. So now that we have our needs, how do we implement something that's so broad? In some cases, like for welding or for safety training, we could contract with other experts in the field that could provide that training for us. We could work with local technical colleges for welding and partner with them to develop something that was appropriate for our crews. And we could also partner with um, safety trainers that and train them on what our practices are and what, how they could help us with identifying appropriate rescue techniques. But what about all the other areas, right? The uh, trades work and some of the bridge maintenance practices that we do uh, as a state agency. There weren't a lot of training sessions that were available off the shelf that you could just bring in for your crews, right, to identify or to develop their skills in that area. So we looked at all those areas and we decided we were going to develop an in-house training program. And it was in the form of Bridge Maintenance Academy. So I think uh, Pete mentioned that in some cases we have a skill, but we may not have that knowledge behind that skill, or we may not know um, how our maintenance activities affect the structure that we're working on. And so Bridge Maintenance Academy was developed to, for that background knowledge. We partnered with Lake Superior College and we brought in some retired MnDOT employees and also experts from our specialty offices like the bridge office and the concrete office. And it was a five-day course and we talked about bridge elements and components, bridge mechanics, design concepts, plan reading, um, basics of concrete and other materials, safety and traffic control, and then just an introduction to bridge preservation. What that means and what sort of activities are involved in, in bridge preservation. Well, it takes a village to make a training program too, is what we found. It takes um, support from upper staff, it takes support from the bridge office, it takes support from our districts, and it takes amazing supervisors around the state to, willing to dedicate their time and their knowledge to develop the curriculum, to train. You know, so we're very fortunate within MnDOT to have all those things come together for us for a training program. As we started rolling this out to MnDOT and then to local agencies, we realized that it was a challenge to put on a five-day course every year and bring in experts, and then also to hold it at a time that works for every agency, because for MnDOT, January is a great time for training because we're not out performing our maintenance activities. But for local agencies, that's a challenge because that takes them away from their snow and ice duties. And so right now, um, our BMA1 is undergoing a conversion to an e-learning that will be available on our website to anyone who would like to take it. For Bridge Maintenance Academy 2 and 3, 
We wanted to take the concepts that we kind of established in Bridge Maintenance Academy 1 and roll them out then into a hands-on learning session. Uh, because we felt like we couldn't just talk about it or, or train in that way. We had to actually teach, guide, you know, by example. And so we bring in multiple supervisors from all over the state, and they, we have assistant instructors that come in and lead the groups in all these areas that we teach for Bridge Maintenance Academy. And so for Academy 2, we focus on some forming, uh, some plan reading applications for constructing a concrete slab and abutment. We look at placing and curing and finishing concrete, tying, bending, placing, reinforcing steel, looking at delaminated areas, and Greg will go into this a little more in detail. And then there's some classroom presentations that we also bring in. And you, when we do Bridge Maintenance Academy 2 and 3, we actually build a bridge, three bridges, as part of 2 and 3. And the reason for that is then that we can implement jacking. Okay? And you may say, well, why are we building a bridge when it's Bridge Maintenance Academy? But the point is, too, to give, ex give um, experience with working with the tools and equipment that you need out doing bridge, ma bridge maintenance, right? So working with concrete tools, working with reinforcing steel, working with um, timber for forming and false work. And so even though we're kind of building that bridge, we're incorporating bridge maintenance skills by doing that. And then we have some other areas where we build in the bridge maintenance activities. One thing I want to touch on real quick, uh, when Sarah said we, we lost an awful lot of experience, I know as a former supervisor, when I saw that 30, 35 year man walk out the door, you can go back and look at that bridge inspection report and you can see a living history of that bridge, but that's only part of the story and, and that 35 year man walked out the door with the rest of the story. So how do we start that story over again with, with new employees? This class was first designed to capture that one to five year employee. When we hire new employees, we look for that trades background in, in carpentry, concrete, iron work. And, and what these classes do in my mind is it takes those trades and puts them together and, and focuses that on how do you now maintain a bridge with all that skill you've brought in because just not carpentry or, or concrete, not that individual skill, it's all gotta be brought together. So when we, when we looked at this, like Sarah said, we went, we went about this building some bridges, okay? You have to have, in my mind, these guys have to learn that knowledge as to how that bridge functions from the ground up. Because when you start doing maintenance on there, if you go too deep somewhere, you could cause another problem. So, so that was kind of, in my mind, the basic concept of what we were doing here. So when these guys come in, we go through the plan reading portion of it. Bridge Maintenance Academy goes... Bridge maintenance one goes into plan reading a little bit deeper than, than two and three, but we do a basic plan. We sit down and these guys go through that plan before they go out into the, into the shop area to start building. And in these photos here you can see they're, they're starting to work on their form work. We start with form work right away and set the foundation, okay? So we go into place in the rebar. How does that foundation go together and how does that rebar then go up into the parapet, the, the back wall, the bridge seat, and whatnot. So that's what they're doing in this photo here. Their first, that's the first step of, of uh, their bridge abutment. We're in Bridge Academy 2, we build the abutments. In 3, we go into uh, the deck portion of it. Also, something else we do while, we're, while the crews are working on this, we'll set up what we call the, the big boys sandbox. And we'll, we'll put up like a 12 by 12 forming put sand in there, and then they can use the variety of equipment. You can see in here the roller screeds, the I call little jitterbug screed they're using there. We also even go into uh, forming your expansion joints with, uh, with, with your cutting tools. Uh, we have the screed that mounts all the way across the forming and then the small one in the middle there. We go through all those tools and then they can mess this up and the variety guys will go through and give everybody a chance to work on those tools before they actually get to pouring the concrete itself. Once that foundation portion is done, of course we've got that, uh, the rebar coming up out of the foundation, then they go into doing the bridge seat. All of this rebar comes in sticks, so you can see they're actually uh, cutting and bending the bar themselves. And there again, it, it's, in my mind, it's an understanding where that bar is placed in that bridge seat, so how that functions, and, and why certain bars are in a certain location. Then when these guys come back at a later time to start cutting in or, or patching, uh, 
concrete spalls, they know what they're going into. Then they go in and they pour the, they pour the abutment. In the process where these things are, are, we're waiting for concrete to set, then they come in and they'll pour that, that pad that they've been playing with the sand before, they'll actually pour a cement pad. We build into that cement pad some DLAM areas. Later on, they'll come back and we'll do some training on, on deck chaining and cutting out and, and doing the patching of that. And then here they get to, with the concrete in place, they start to run that equipment. And the beauty part about the sand is it kind of imitates or mimics concrete a little bit. So before they actually get to the concrete portion, they got a feel for it, they jump on there, and then they get to, get to go after concrete. And there again, we'll do the same thing. Once, once they finish that, we'll come in, we'll mess that all up, and the next few fellows can come in or whoever wants to can grab that and then they'll refinish that. We'll work that concrete until it gets to the point where we can no longer uh, mess it up and we'll finish it and then we'll move on. Bring in our floats and our, and our uh, um, the rest of our screed equipment and, and do the finishing portion of it. You see up in, the, in the, the top right there, they're finishing that foundation and they're working around the rebar that's coming out, out of the foundation. Tining and cutting. All those tools that we use out on the project, they get an opportunity to use, and, and they can manually cut in their, their expansion joint. We do this, the sawed expansion joint as well, and, and we'll do whatever we need to. We'll get, we'll get whoever wants to grab whatever tool on there and, and practice doing that. This is where we go back in where I said we had built in some DLAM. We'll put some uh, foam pad down in there, and we'll have them go on there and start chaining that, locate the DLAM area, mark it out, then they'll come saw cut it, and they'll actually then they'll they'll mix patch together. We usually bring in, I'm going to say probably a, probably at least a half a dozen different types of patch material, and the different crews will will uh, use a variety of patches to see how fast they set, how how they work, how easy they are to finish, how much time you have. You know, there's a there's a variety of patches out there. Some of them move a lot faster than others. Some have different mixing requirements. So, so we try to introduce a variety of patch material for them to choose from warm weather, cold weather, which works the best. We also go through an exercise of steel repair. As you can see, one of our instructors up there, you know, they'll sit and explain the, the type of tools we use, how to use those tools, and then uh, get, the, get the crew in there with their hands on it. They'll be marking and drilling holes to set uh, their diaphragms, their, their angle brackets, and all that in there. You can see in the top right, he's actually doing, uh, doing up in the, in the web area, we actually do that steel exercise then. In Bridge Academy too, we put, the, put that all together. They'll come in and they have the opportunity to, and, and there again, you, you take a look at your plan and the placement of those holes have to be done accurately. So, you know, we've had some, you know, had some, uh, some times when it gets installed and have to take it back apart because it was put together wrong and, and then to come tightening you can't get your tools on. So, so through that, that course of events it's a good learning experience as to how to, how to do it and uh, naturally up in the top right you can see him put his angle brackets in. We found if that goes in the wrong way the tools don't go on there properly. There again still working on the steel exercise. Uh, this is actually, actually putting the putting the diaphragm, the angle brackets, and everything on. And you can see the tightening uh, we do. We go through the, the turn of the bolt method. We do some torquing on there. A couple different varieties to get those, get those uh, nuts and bolts torqued down properly. Bridge Maintenance Academy 3, we do the deck portion. This is a completed bridge. That's what it'll look like when we're done. Once these guys come in, uh, ba you know, once we're completely done, an idea again is to jack this up and do bearing repair on it as well. So we, so that, that's a, uh, to have a whole bridge sitting inside there and to go through the jacking, the jacking uh, equipment is, is real beneficial to them. Setting bearings, um, of course forming and pouring the deck, and then we go through the strip seal. We'll, we'll put a strip seal in as well. Uh, the jacking technique, they'll come in and they'll do strip seal repair and, and whatnot. Setting the bearings, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a learning experience to get all this stuff set square on there. When, when the Bridge Academy 2 does the abutments, they square those all up because uh, coming to set this stuff in it, uh, we spend sometimes quite a little time getting this set up uh, because when you come with your steel beams to put it on and, and you're off by a little bit, everything else is not going to fit either. So you can see them setting their bearings there. Down on the floor, they're putting their... Uh, diaphragms together to tie them first two beams together and then you can see them coming up and 
and setting those beams in there. A lot of measuring goes on, a lot of, a lot of people involved to get, that, to get that positioned properly. Here you'll see them working on installation of that strip seal gland, or the strip seal extrusions are being prepared to go in. They're doing their false work, getting ready for the deck. And there again, it's, uh, the, the working on this false work is, we had a, a crew there that didn't think about it properly and they were putting that all together in one piece. We put it together in a few pieces so once the deck is poured, you can get your false work back out. They gotta think about the diaphragms that are in their, in their way so when they come in to do a, a patch later on or whatever, it gives them a good experience as to how that should be done properly so it can come back out. Up on top here, you can see them placing and, and tying their rebar. They go through that, uh, got your stools set in there, and then they pour their deck. Our focus on this is building the bridge. It's not, uh, we had some questions. We, we run that concrete out very workable so we can play with it for a while. Some of the guys will say, well, why is our concrete such a high slump? It's not about the concrete, I tell them, it's about the procedure itself. So, so we can work this and we can mess with it for a while. That's the idea behind it, to get everybody's hands in there. Then you see them uh, uh, doing some floating there and, and edging, getting ready to do their uh, joint. Well, we, do, we saw our, our joints later on that one. Strip seal maintenance, bearing maintenance, uh, bridge jacking considerations, a strip seal gland repair. You can see us over there once concrete's all set and we get the crew back up on it, they'll pull them glands in and out a few times. You know, we'll have everybody come up and give that a try. There's a variety of tools we use for installation. And then uh, we go into doing uh, gland repair. When a gland is not, not to the point where it needs to be replaced, you've got some uh, pullouts or holes in that. There's a variety of uh, types of material we use. So there's a couple different ones for sure we go through to show them how to uh, repair that that gland uh, to get that back to, for you know whatever longevity we can get out of it before it needs to be replaced. Removing the deck false work here again, if it's been built and, and set in there properly, it's a bit easier to get out, but uh, at least they learn how to get it in and out of there. Once that's all pulled out, then we go back up on the top and there again, we've built in some DLAM areas. They'll, they will uh, chain their deck, locate them, pull them out, and we do partial and full depth repairs where they have to put their, their underpinning back in, uh, go through the deck, or a partial repair. And again, then we use a variety of, of patch material, whatever they, you know, whatever we have available to. Usually our crews will bring something that they liked, you know, or, or worked well. So then we get to see a few different varieties of that. Installing the strip seal gland. It was, uh, it was uh, I don't know if anybody really got in trouble or not. I see one of our instructors is sitting here and, and um, when they try to put the wrong gland into an extrusion, it can be quite interesting because they'll fight with that for quite some time and then finally somebody will go, something's wrong here. So, so we actually do go through a gland identification procedure now so these guys know what to look for, what size that lug is to make sure when they go out to that project they actually have the right gland along with them. We do have an inventory system that, that has our glands per bridge, but over the course of time, it may have been changed out with something else. So we do go through that gland identification uh, uh, process with them. Then into the jacking portion, again, it's, it's go through that equipment. You know, a lot of these guys have probably never seen this. We work with extremely high pressures, as many of you know, so, so you have to be uh, very safety conscious when you're working with this. How those jacks, as you can see in here, we've got some, some uh, uh, blocking going up to there. How is that set in there when you have, a, say, a 28 or a 30 inch, you have to fill that space. How do you put that together so it's stable? Because you're, you're putting, a, you know, 100 ton jacks on each one of those. So you got a lot of pressure. So there's a whole safety thing and then how that process works together, tying that into a manifold, where people should be located to watch when, when the jacks actually contact, how much pressure's on there, the man running that pump, all that works together lifting that up. And then we can, we can do our lift, do our bearing uh, repair or replacement, whatever you're doing, and then how you uh, pull that pressures back off and let that, uh, 
that deck back down. So. The goal of this is to transfer the knowledge from our experienced bridge workers to our next generation bridge workers. And we want to ensure that we have uniform best practices that are applied statewide and that we have um, workers around the state that can be effective and efficient in their, in their job. It's a continual improvement process. <laughs> So after every academy, we gather evaluations and we try to make it better the next time. And we get feedback from both MnDOT and local agencies and we try to improve that each time and, and the supervisors have been very gracious of helping us out with, with doing that. Challenges of this type of training, figuring out a location that's gonna work to build three bridges in February in Minnesota, right? Uh, sequencing of events. Uh, how much time do we need to allow for kind of a new crop of employees to build the abutment, you know, tie, get the reinforcing steel placed and put the form on before you can order concrete? And in February, we kind of have to be careful of when we order concrete too. Uh, materials, making sure we have enough materials available in there for the training. Tools and equipment, we have tools and equipment that come from around the state and our districts are very gracious by bringing that, those tools and equipment for others to use and learn. Finding instructors and group leaders to donate a week of their time basically to this training program. And then developing the curric curriculum and continuously improving the curriculum can be a challenge in all of this. Uh, some of our other training, which we'll go through real quickly because I know we're kind of running out of time. I'll let Greg speak a little bit about welding, but we have contracted with basic technical colleges and we've worked with them to develop a curriculum that makes sense for our bridge maintenance crews in both welding basics and intermediate welding. On the welding, like Sarah said, we, we reached out to see what kind of training needs were out there and it was overwhelming that our, our guys wanted to do some welding. So we started out with a, with a basic welding the first year going through right, right down to how to set your torches, welding rods. I mean, they're very basic stuff and then they got into doing welding. It took them, a, you know, they went through a week class. They come out of there very, I would say, very comfortable with their with the skill they learned. Then we went into a, a more intermediate or advanced welding where we were doing the verticals, the, the horizontals, the overheads, that type of thing. And at the end of that class, we had our, our, the skill level to where these guys could actually be certified to do structural welding. Now we don't do a lot of that, but we do you know, individual projects. So, so our crews are skilled to the point where they can be certified for, for a various project of structural welding. That's the point we're at when we do this, the welding. Um, also, real quickly, I'll move into our high angle rescue. We have a, a three day initial class in our high angle rescue training, three two day refresher classes. They go through the rescue planning, knot tying, equipment familiarization. The, what really got this going for us is we have many, many remote locations where where first responders probably don't have the capability, the equipment or anything, if there was an accident of some kind. Say a snooper was hit, people were thrown out of the basket. So how do we, how do we handle that? We basically decided that we need to train ourselves up to rescue ourselves. So that's, that's really what got this going. So, so today I think the majority, pretty much all of our bridge crews, everyone is trained in high angle rescue. The department, bought the initial equipment we needed to, to run everybody through that. And, and here you can see where we've got snooper basket uh, repelling out, ascending in and out of that basket. How do you get yourself in and out? What equipment do you carry in that basket with you? When someone has been uh, launched out of that basket, how do you go down and rescue them and get them back down to the ground? Various equipment we use in, even in and, out, in and out of a lift um, down on the the left bottom there, that's where we actually go and, and descend and ascend back in and out of the basket or on the lower right where you're actually trying to pull a victim back up into the basket. Now there's, there's a variety of equipment available to us. When, when you have a smaller person in there, a larger person, you gotta get them up into there. And if you can't get them in, how do you, how do you situate that victim so they, they can breathe or until you can wait for other help to come, come and, uh, and help get them down. And we partnered with First Strike Safety and they worked really closely with our crews to develop a training that was pertinent to the work type of work that we do and the equipment that we use. We also worked with Aspen Aerials to um, modify our snooper baskets for footholds and handholds to be able to get back in. Because as we were trying to ascend back into the basket, we realized it was very difficult on some of those you know, flat faces, flat, flat slippery faces. So. 
was key to work with those partners. We also do um, confined space rescue training. It's not confined space training. It's how do you how do you rescue someone who's gone down in a confined space? You can see here we're in a smaller smaller culvert. There's a variety of areas we get into where where that need could be possible. On the right hand side, you see them uh, wrapped up in a sked device where they're actually pulling them up. We use a Z rig, a three to one type apparatus with our ropes and pulleys to get to get them back up onto the bank. And then finally, um, some activities don't really lend themselves for a truck station type training like flushing or crack sealing. And so we wanted to identify some of those activities that we found or we felt were key to preservation, some of these preventive maintenance, and how do we kind of implement a training program surrounding those activities. We can do some on the job training, but we didn't want the crews just to be put out there and have no knowledge of it before they were having to do that type of work. And so we have started developing e-learning modules surrounding preventive maintenance. And it talks about preparation and planning, it talks about equipment and materials, it talks about why we perform this type of work, and then the best practices surrounding that type of maintenance. Currently we have crack sealing and strip seal gland repair on our website, available for anyone to use. And in progress is flushing and joint sealing, which will be coming soon. You know, one thing I'd like to touch on real quickly, yesterday I heard uh, Sue Movahill and, and Paul Cavisto talk about how we design and build bridges to last 100 years. We have to keep in mind, and we're all aware of that, once that bridge opens up to traffic, our maintenance forces are on there pretty much immediately, maintaining that bridge. And without those maintenance forces, I don't think the bridge would last that 100 years. We, we got to take care of it all the way through to the end of it. So that's what we're here for. You mentioned uh, um, the uh, turn of the nuts versus DTI. What's the DTI? Okay, the DTI is a, is got that, um, I, I'm going to call it an ink pocket in there. As you squish that down, once that, that squishes out, it's supposed to be tight enough. And I guess I've used those, one, you know, you, you, you put your pressure on to the point where that, that liquid squirts out of there and that's, that should be your torque presser, pressure on the DTI. Is that, is that an approved method for um, uh, tying the bolts other than turn yep. off the nuts? Yep. Correct. Yes. yes, yes, correct. Um, is the training uh, right now just for your maintenance workers or do you have contractors participate too? We started out basically with our bridge maintenance crews and right now it's opened up to all of our local agencies as well. I don't know that we have any contract people coming in at all yet. That is one impressive program. So, uh, you know, a uh, big round of applause for you all. Uh the preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.